I'm David Thorburn, director of the MIT Communications Forum and professor of literature at MIT. This is the third and final uh, forum in our series, Will Newspapers Survive? Uh, and uh, uh, in a moment, I will introduce our three panelists and talk briefly about our uh, scheme for today. My hope is that our conversation will genuinely be accretive, that uh, those I see already many uh, uh, familiar faces, and that uh, as more people straggle in, we will actually have a core audience who's been here for all of the events, uh, unlike our speakers who have not had the advantage of being here in person, although I know that they've been able to consult the website and read, read the text summaries and so forth. Um, I wanted to begin by making a couple of very brief comments of my own uh, ab about our series and about the way I feel it's gone so far, partly as an incitement to our audience to, to uh, ask pointed and, and uh, um, even perhaps aggressive questions. My colleague Brad Sewell, who is my indispensable right arm and keeps the forum afloat, uh, suggested to me when we were planning this event that the final title for the third of our of our uh, uh, forums, Why Newspapers Matter, was somewhat inappropriate. And he said, you should say instead, do newspapers matter? And I thought for a long time about this. He's probably right. <laughs> uh, if, you, if, you paid if you paid attention to our, to our first two forums, you might actually feel especially that that was a much more appropriate question. Why take for granted that there are values in newspapers that uh, uh, um, it must be defended or articulated. And I thought for a long time about yielding to Brad's common sense uh, uh, suggestion, but decided against it, perhaps out of nostalgia. Uh, I nearly became a newspaper man myself, and when I was, a, when I was in college, I, was, I, I served as the stringer for a whole series of, of uh, newspapers. The, I went to a university midway between New York and Philadelphia, and uh, in the time I was an undergraduate, there were, daily, there were uh, a, a very large number of daily newspapers in both cities, uh, and, and the folks who worked in the press club to which I belonged were able to serve all of these newspapers. Uh, at various times in my own life, I have served as a writer for now, the now defunct New York Herald Tribune, the United Press International, Associated, the Associated Press, the New York Times, and the experience working with uh, grown-up journalists, I was just a college man at the time, uh, was very instructive to me. It seemed to me that the journalists I dealt with when I was a young man had a particular passion for their work and a particular sense of mission uh, that reminded me not of uh, people who were out to sort of make a, they reminded me of teachers who uh, do what they do mostly out of, out of love of the work, not because they are very well paid. Uh, and I think that there is still some tradition of that in American journalism. So in any case, it may be a kind of nostalgia in me uh, that led to uh, uh, insisting against my uh, friend Sewell's advice that we keep the title, Why Newspapers Matter. And my hope is that, in fact, you, uh, uh, we will try to answer that question. And if you doubt that newspapers have any value at all, I encourage you to try to say that. Oh, thank you. I, I'll just step back a bit. Uh, that, that, I'm not sure how helpful that was, Sewell, but we'll, we'll, li we'll live with it. Uh, what, what, I, uh, what, 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 I want, what I want to suggest, though, about the discourse we've had so far to try to contextualize where we stand uh, from, from my own uh, some perhaps nostalgic and uh, not disinterested perspective uh, might run something like this. It seems to me that the discourse we've had so far has been too utopian. It's been too much in favor of the, of the new. It has not been sufficiently attentive to what newspapers have been in American life, uh, to, to what they, and, and maybe more broadly and culturally, in, in, in other societies generally. And my hope is that we will interrogate more systematically, in our, at least in our discussion, and I know that our speakers are going to address this question today, uh, that we will interrogate really systematically what it is about newspapers, at least in the past, what it, about the role of newspapers in society that, uh, um, signifies that matters that is that 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 is that is distinctive, and the particular way in which I would raise not uh, uh, not total hostile opposition, but questions, uh, dubieties about the kind of argument that I'll call the utopians have been making, falls into two separate categories. One is, in a certain sense, ideological or political, and the other uh, is cultural. 
The ideological or political problems, it seems to me, is that it seems to me that the people who talk about uh, the excitement of the new interactive technologies and the, and the magnificent possibilities that are available to us and will become available in future because of, because of the internet and, 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 and other uh, 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 amazing uh, uh, likely outcomes that will follow from our exploring the possibilities of digital technology. The pro not, not that the vision of astonishing uh, uh, possibilities is mistaken. It's obviously correct, and there's no question at all that these these uh, these new these new modes of communication have a transformative and potentially morally and politically revolutionary effect on society. Of course, that's that's obvious. Although the revolution may be a very long one, it may not be the right word to use since cultural change takes time, and we might think of it as an evolutionary process. No one, I think, who's paid attention would dispute that. But it does seem to me that the rhetoric of the folks who talk about the transition we're in and, the, and uh, uh, falls in, uh, makes at least some easy assumptions that I want to uh, mention to you quickly. And one of them, one of these easy assumptions uh, has to do with the, with the value that is assumed to inhere in words like participatory, interactive, and even the word democratic. Uh, this, uh, of course, these are very important categories, but when you set those categories up as if they are uh, unproblematic and as if every activity which lacks a participatory dimension in the way you define participation uh, is somehow inadequate, uh, then the game is over before it begins. Of course, newspapers are less interactive than certain forms of digital technology, but the, that doesn't mean that they're not interactive in some sense, and it, nor does it mean that every human activity needs to have interactivity in it. It, it, it is certainly the case that Shakespeare's plays do not permit the same degree of interactivity as, as, as certain forms of video games. But it doesn't follow from that that Shakespeare is inferior to the experience of video games. So that the, 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 issue, the issue is not that participatory or interactive dimensions of communication technologies are not valuable, but, but that they are not the only value, nor is the absence of these qualities or the relative absence of these qualities necessarily a source for uh, skepticism about the technologies, forms of communication that seem less interactive. More needs to be said about these questions than simply to say, well, this is interactive and this is not. Uh, th there, are, there are forms of interactivity that can actually be very annoying and troublesome and unhelpful to certain kinds of enterprises. Not all enterprises uh, have to be democratic. Right? Uh, uh, so, so I think that there's an ideological or political dimension to the, to, to the arguments that are, that, or, or to the discussions that surround questions of the sort that we're facing in this series that need to be interrogated more closely, that we need to be more skeptical and more rigorous about what we mean by the interactive, what we mean by the participatory, and we need to ask questions about what, what activities re, uh, most fundamentally require and are benefited by participatory activities and interactivity, and what activities may be, uh, need less interactivity or need an interactivity of a different sort. Because it isn't true, of course, that the audience for Shakespeare's plays or the reader of Tolstoy's novels are not interacting in the profoundest ways with these old technologies. With, with, uh, but, but they are interacting in ways that are different from the capacity to decide what plot twist is coming next. They are not collaborators with the author in quite the same way that certain kinds of collaborative websites create genuine forms of participation and collaboration. I hope it's clear that I'm not suggesting that these forms of collaboration or interaction are negative or bad in any way. I'm just suggesting that to constantly, to, to, raise, to, to, to say this form of communication, this form of news gathering is much more interactive than that is for me not to make a powerful point about whether or not the older form is, is less valuable or more valuable. The cultural aspect of this argument also seems to me important. And by that I mean, I think that there's been an insufficient attention so far to what might be called the ritual or embedded cultural dimensions of newspapers. Uh, newspapers, in the, at least in the United States and in many other countries, offer certain forms of experience that are uh, 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 very difficult to find elsewhere. And one thing that, uh, quite apart from the question of whether newspapers provide information to people, which of course they do at some level, uh, they do other things as well. They organize the world. 
uh, and they organize the world on a daily basis. And, and, and uh, they, they create a universe that is, in some sense, more fundamentally unified and coherent than the atomistic uh, universe we might find in, uh, in other communication systems and other communication forms. Uh, and and uh, the way in which newspapers organize the world and the way in which they organize the world every day uh, anew uh, is an experience that's much more complex than we've yet given attention to. When you sit down on Sunday morning uh, with your partner to take the New York Times or the Washington Post apart and share out parts of it, you're, you're engaged in a social behavior and an interactive behavior with your partners or your friends. That's also part of the ritual of using and reading newspapers. Uh, um, so it's important for us to think about and, 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 and consider other aspects of the experience of newspapers, of the way in which newspapers have been institutionalized and instantiated in American life in order for us to get a, a, a real, a, a full sense uh, of what would be lost if newspapers genuinely disappeared or if the aging of the newspaper readership reached the point that there were virtually no more, no more readers for newspapers and they essentially, except for certain great national brands that were able to keep themselves going, essentially disappeared as cultural forces. Finally, I want to suggest that there is a, another overtly political dimension to the role of newspapers, especially in American life, that we need to pay a little more attention to than we have so far. I'm talking about the fact that newspapers uh, operate under the protection of the First Amendment, unlike other forms of communication, uh, and that there is a long tradition of the newspapers as a kind of independent political observer who, who, who can stand up against and, and, uh, and sometimes even defy the demands of government, the loss, of a, the loss of an institution of that kind in any society would obviously be a serious one. We need to ask questions about whether in the transition, we're, w the long transition we're making from paper to digital, <laughs> to di from a paper world to a digital world, from a, from a, from, from, from a, from a dead tree technology to a, to a digital technology, we need to ask questions of that sort, about the, uh, uh, w whether or not uh, the new systems of communication and the new systems of news gathering that are going to emerge in our society in, 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 a, in a digital environment uh, are going to uh, offer the kind of, the kind of political and, 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 and moral independence that at least the ideal of certain news, of, of newspapers in the United States and the practice of some newspapers certainly justifies. Well, that's my response to what we've done so far. I hope it's an incitement to the audience to ask questions and to fight, argue, not just with me, but with uh, other speakers and even speakers who may not even be here. Uh, it's now my, uh, it's now my uh, uh, great pleasure to introduce our speakers and to uh, uh, explain our format. They, uh, all of our speakers have, have uh, uh, kindly agreed to keep their uh, arguments tight. They're going to make brief uh, introductory statements. I'm going to time them closely. They'll stop after a relatively short time. We're going to try to maximize our opportunity for participation and interaction, a value I really do embrace, of course. Our, our speakers, st starting, starting here, uh, Pablo Bochowski is, a, is a, uh, a professor in the Department of Communication Studies at Northwestern. He, uh, uh, many MIT folks know him because he was here at, uh, at, at, at MIT before moving to Northwestern. He's the author of a very interesting book called Digitizing the News, Innovation in Online Newspapers. And his recent research, which he's going to talk to us about, deals with other aspects of this topic in ways that I'm uh, excited about hearing. Jerome Armstrong, uh, see, seated in the middle, although he'll be, we're going to talk in alphabetical order, so it'll be Jerome, Pablo, and Dante in that, in, in that order. Uh, uh, J uh, what we're it's Jerome's last name. It's the A that makes him go first, Armstrong. Uh, uh, Armstrong is the founder of Netroots.com. He's the creator of the political blog uh, MyDD.com, and he's the author, uh, of, uh, co-author of Crashing the Gate, Netroots, Grassroots, and the Rise of People-Powered Politics. Finally, Dante Chini is the uh, senior research associate for, in, uh, for the Project for Excellence in Journalism, a media columnist for the Christian Science Monitor. He's also served as a reporter for the na on the National Affairs Desk at Newsweek magazine. We're going to begin with uh, uh, Jerome Armstrong, proceed to Pablo, then to Dante. Thank you, David. Hello, everybody. I'm going to um, do these introductory remarks and from a perspective of talking a little bit about um, my interaction of, I, I think, how I, be, I come into this discussion and then um, 
segue from that, and that'll be mostly about blogs and, and what I do a lot on the web, and then segue from that into the interaction with blogs and other forms of communications and how that interacts with uh, newspapers, and then looking at some uh, questions and, and things for thoughts of, for the uh, ensuing discussion. So backing into the subject from the, the perspective of blogs, I, I don't spend a lot of time uh, watching television or you know, reading newspapers. I might do um, when I go through an airport, pick one up that somebody's left behind. But um, the actual activity of reading a newspaper for me has dropped off tremendously in the, in the, over the last decade. I can remember a time, this being you know a month before the election, when I would go down and buy the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and scour over them for the political news of the day leading up to the elections. Well, now with the, the elections about a month away, what I would wind up doing is going out in the blogosphere and reading about 30 different blogs and finding out all the different poll information there and everything as far as opinion-wise would come from the blogs. So taking a step back for a moment, how did, how did this happen? Well, looking at it from my perspective, and I'm a, I'm a partisan Democrat, I work for Democratic candidates and a, um, a progressive, the, for, for me and, and, and a lot of people like me, what, what we saw in the early part of this decade was a lack of a progressive voice in the mainstream media outlets. There was, I mean, by all accounts, you know, you can, the right wing will say that the, the mainstream media is, is liberal in orientation and they might be in philosophy, but I certainly don't, wouldn't adhere to the, the belief that the, the, the mainstream media is democratic in any way. And so the rise of the blogs was in, in large part a reaction to not only a, a right wing propaganda machine, but also the lack of progressive voices in the establishment media. The probably you can point to a couple different events along this path with the rise of the progressive blogosphere, and we'll get to, I'll get to some numbers here in a second. But I first point out the, um, the 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 debacle that we had in Florida in 2000. Next along the line would be the the vote by the Democrats leading up into the 2002 midterms to uh, give Bush the permission to invade and occupy Iraq. And then the, um, the phenomenon of Howard Dean and the rise of the net roots and what's happening this last cycle, which is much more of a, a, a decentralized effort of the local blogosphere. It's gotten to the point now where that, how many blogs are there? Well, there's, there's millions of blogs according to Technorati, but if you look at the, the top tier blogs in terms of the numbers, it's increased in size since 2003 by 100 times. The liberal blog ad, work, ad, net, the liberal blog ad network is, it comprises about 100 of the leading blogs and it received over 120 million page views in this last month and that represents probably around uh, 15 million people that are actively engaged in it. Um, these people are very politically active. Among self-identified Democrats, 23% in a recent hotline poll visit the blogs on a regular basis and they tend to vote too. The Pew, a Pew study post-election 2004 found that 99% of those interviewed that were Dean supporters voted. So th though this is a, a minority, even by accounts of participation within the democratic universe, they are very strong in terms of their, their opinions and their particip participation in the, in the uh, political process. Stepping away from the political blogs then, the overall blog readership right now, according to a, a recent survey by the blog ads, is at about 50 million. And those blogs transpire every sort of you know, topic you can imagine. Anybody's interest that they basically have, they will go to a blog and a lot of people will, and, and find those interests in being able to uh, congregate, talk about it with other people. The relationship between blogs and, and other sorts of mediums is symbiotic from my experience and a lot of what I see on the, on the internet. It's, it's not that a lot of content is generated by blogs, bloggers themselves, but they will go to more traditional media sites, such as newspaper, online newspapers, and, and portal sites, MSNBC, CNN, those type of things, and they will, they will feed off those, write their opinions off it, but it's also, it goes both ways. You have a lot more journalists now who write for print and, and online that go to the blogs to find out what's the recent stories that are breaking. Blogs are sort of, you know, they've, they've bust, busted open the gateway that used to be there for media, but now they're in many ways a, a, a place for people to try out opinions or, or leads and, and see if they can gain traction in, in the wider sphere. Let me present a couple of different uh, um, statements here on the relationship of blogs and newspapers. The first is by Corby Parnell and talking about the difference between news and opinions. New, he says, newspapers are a dying medium, however blogging will not be the cause of its death, nor will blogs replace newspapers as a primary source of news for a majority of the world's population. 
Fair and balanced journalism is good journalism. When I seek out news, I don't read Robert Novak. Instead, I read the Associated Press. On the whole, individual bloggers will never consistently produce the kind of original, highly refined, unbiased content that even small town newspaper readers have come to expect and value. However, the thought energy that bloggers put into their reporting and news aggregation efforts can and will be leveraged by other participatory mediums, such as wiki news, and will therefore contribute to and hasten the demise of the newspaper medium. Of course, it's also possible that the newspaper medium will survive by aggregating good content from the blogs. And, and that particular, that last point that he makes is, is something that I've seen happen more and more. Um, blogs, like any other medium, once they, once they reach a certain threshold of, of of communication uh, possibility, the, the commercialization uh, um, enters into it because it costs more to run those things. The, the convergence then of new, newspapers adapting to blogs involves the commercialization of those blogs. The, here's another quote here. The, the Arizona Republic, the Des Moines Register, and the San Jose Mercury News were among a group of publishers that signed up for Blogburst, a blog syndication service, under the terms of the agreement, newspapers can publish any of more than 1,500 blogs featured by the service. And how this works is that, you know, if somebody writes a, a review of something locally or, say, covers a sports story, those can syndicate right into the, into the uh, uh, newspapers if they have that agreement set up. And one other quote here is from the American state, Statesman in Austin. They offer tools on his website that enable readers to create their own blogs, which can then be posted on the paper's website. Since starting the later service, since late September, the newspaper has seen readers create over 100, 875 blogs, and there's about 2,500 page views a day. He, the, the Austin Statesman acknowledges that blogs have yet to attract huge audiences, but the point is to offer readers a chance to connect with like-minded folks. The idea behind this is to create more of a community, you can create community and you'll increase traffic and loyalty. To me, that's a really interesting statement because it, it points to why, I believe, why blogs have, have arisen in, you know, across the whole stratification of different um, interests and stuff. I mentioned why, you know, one reason why I thought the political blogs have arisen, but it really doesn't explain the whole wider phenomenon of blogging in general. But I think what this, what this person is pointing to is in, the, in the sense of community that it offers, we need to ask the question, does is with that sense of community the blogs are creating, is that replacing something that newspapers offered or is it offering something that newspapers haven't offered? If we segue from that into looking at this period as a transition period and in particularly uh, recognizing the, the niche medias that have been created by the internet in, in reaction to what I would call the broadcast medium, uh, Okay, the broadcast effort of uh, the last century. If you look at the, um, over the last, in, last uh, century, there's been basically the print medium, then radio, then television, which has been the broadcast, the, the means of getting out your message to a large number of people. And you have basically a one to many message delivery. Somebody will formulate the message, it'll get delivered out through the broadcast mediums. The whole fragmentation that's happened of that structure over the last couple of decades is, is points towards what's going to happen in the future. The, the, the means of delivering your message now has become much more niche, much more one-to-one. -one. Marketers figure out how to, how to identify you through data mining and, and such forth and deliver your message to you in a much more compelling manner. How, the only way it's really effective to reach you now in terms of mass delivery is to get a wide adoption of your message by many people who will then forward on to their networks because people have basically lost touch, a lot of them, with those broadcast mediums. So this is some, basic, some, some overriding questions that I have here in terms of the, the newspapers and their relevancy. Are they going to be able to customize their content in a way that can be compelling as online news services are? You have much more easier ability now to go out and get your niche media in the online capacity than you do on the broadcast. It's, you know, you have your A1 page on the newspaper is that more compelling, that's authoritarian figure, than if you go online and, and you capture basically an interest that responds to your likes and dislikes immediately? That's my two minutes, ten minutes, and thank you.
Um, a couple of months ago, I was there uh, and I had to give sort of a similar talk, the first talk on this project. So it was July 27th, actually, and I uh, wanted to check what the papers that I had been studying were reporting that day, and in particular how their front pages look like. What you see here are the front pages of the top two national print newspapers in Argentina, combined market share of 50% of the national newspaper market. The top newspaper, Diario Clarín, is 34% share of the national newspaper market. The second one, La Nación, is 50% share. What you see is that the top national story about the, uh, the national government in Diario Clarín is the same top national story placed exactly in the same position in its competitor. The top foreign story about Hezbollah and the fight between Hezbollah and Israel which is also the top, uh, so the top story for the top one newspaper, the top story for the second newspaper, also placed in somewhat similar position. The top sort of local news about a, a, a massive rain that had happened the day before is also shared by the two newspapers and is the story that has the most prominent visual, right, most prominent photo picture, more or less, of the same, a car destroyed. And then finally, the top health science medicine story is shared by both. So basically, what you have here is the top two newspapers in the entire country, 50% right, of the market share for the entire print industry, on a particular day sharing basically most of their front pages. Now, is this a fluke or not? Is this an outlier, just a coincidence, or is part of a larger trend? This paper and this research argues that it is part of a larger trend, a larger trend that has a lot to do with certain technical practices, certain ways in which the web has been used in the past four or five years to provide breaking news throughout the day, has actually led in an unintended manner to a growing convergence of content, sharing of content, thematic overlap, not just among online newspapers, but in the entire media space, in particular in print. And so what this paper tries to do is to try to show this empirically and to understand what role certain technical practices play in this phenomenon. It does this through a content analysis of both print and online newspapers in Argentina. The results very quickly are that over a 10 year period, there has been a systematic growth in the sharing or in the overlap of content among print newspapers coinciding a lot with intensification of publishing constant breaking news all the, online during the day, right? That this cycle over a 10 year period for print repeats itself over a 24 hour period for online, right? You take online newspapers at you know, midnight and online newspapers 23 and a half hours later, you see a convergence of their news agenda and that what we have today is in general a very dense web of content homogeneity, content overlap in the entire media spectrum. So what I would like to do at the end of it after presenting basically a little bit more of this is to draw some conceptual and if you're interested in methodological implications and since they asked me to make sure that I will have something very direct to say about the content of this seminar, the implications for this I will say now and I will say at the end of it are, as I see, very simple. So the question is, why might newspapers matter less than before? Because they have themselves commodified their hard news content. Right? They have commodified one of their main contributions, right, as commercial product and also in society, right? Contributions to a policy, to a public sphere, and they have they may matter less and they may matter even less in the future because this decreases their power in terms of setting the agenda, and also their, this decreases their contribution to a diverse public sphere in society. I won't bore you with theoretical implications or the grounding. In general, one quick thing to say, and that motivates the overall project of this paper, is that among my colleagues, sociologists of media, there has been a lot of talk about this trend that more and more media resembles each other, 
But this talk has not been accompanied with a lot of systematic research, and in particular research that looks at thing, uh, things unfolding over time and across media. So in the house of comparative media studies, you know, the work that Henry, David, and William have been doing over time, I thought it was particularly important to emphasize that one needs to look at this phenomenon relationally and over time, which is what this paper tries to do. A couple of things about the Argentine context so that you understand sort of the overall basics of the story, because this is not the US. Like first, the penetration of the internet in the years which data for this paper was collected last year was about 25% of the population, so it's not a massive meeting, it's still a meeting for the big. Secondly, the newspaper industry, unlike the industry in the States, is not local, it's national, one. Second, it's highly concentrated, top two players on 50% of the market, top <coughs> five on two thirds of the two, two thirds of the market, 55% roughly. Second, unlike the US, the share of the advertising pie of the newspaper industry has remained more or less constant over the past 10 years. And even though Argentina suffered, as some of you may know, a massive economic crisis in 01, 02, uh, sorry, 0, uh, 00, and 01, the industry has recovered quite handsomely. For instance, uh, in the past year, when newspapers in the States were firing people left and right, the top newspaper in Argentina made salary increases across the board for all its personnel amounted to 35% salary raises. Partly to catch up on inflation, but partly because business is good. So this is not happening in the context in which business is bad and resources are being shared. shared. It's actually quite the contrary. So, the cast of characters, three newspapers. The top player, top player for print, top player for online. Relative to the size of the country, 40 million people, the top player is a fairly large newspaper. It would basically mean if we adjust it to the size of the state, having a daily circulation of 3 million and a Sunday circulation of 6 million. And it's the second largest newspaper, print newspaper in the Spanish-speaking world. Second, and it's also the top online newspaper as well. Uh, second character, the second uh, largest print newspaper, and also the second largest online newspaper. Third character, a newspaper which in the print world it's a very small financial daily, 1% of the market. So we are not going to look at it for print, but I looked at it for online because it has become over the past three, four years a very, very strong competitor online, partly because of its aggressive practices of publishing online news constantly throughout the day. The final thing to keep in mind here is that in all these cases organizationally, we have two newsrooms. We don't have one newsroom sharing. So it's not the issue of one organization sharing, it's only two organizations sharing, and for the top player, they are apart, you know, basically three miles apart from each other, or about two miles apart from each other. So really, they are two different organizations. Okay, quick thing about the research design. I looked at the front pages of the top two print newspapers, and the equivalent online, the first screen, so the top nine stories, basically, for the top three online newspapers for print over a 10 year period for online over a 24 hour cycle. For print, I look at four periods, right, over these 10 years. First, in 1995, immediately before their online counterparts started to publish, that's my baseline. Then, in 2000, right, immediately before the online counterparts started to publish breaking updates during the day. For the first five years, like many newspapers in the States, these online newspapers basically took the print content and put it on the computer. So I wanted to see whether their very existence, but not the practice of publishing online, had made any difference. And then, starting in 01, they started to publish more and more breaking news during the day. And in particular, in 2004, they moved very aggressively into that arena. So my third and fourth data points come from basically half a year after they moved aggressively into publishing online and a year and a half. And this is what I found. That between 1995 and 2000, right, there is no difference in between the front pages of these two newspapers. So five years of existence of the online edition has made no difference. However, when online started right, to publish aggressively, that actually made a difference for print. Basically, in 1995 and 2000, the two, in these two samples, one in three hard news stories were shared. However, when we go to the 04 and 05, one in two, about the same. With a small growth between 04 and 05, raising the possibility, right, that this trend is going upwards. Secondly, of the stories that they share, this growth impacts more heavily public affairs stories. 18% right? more sharing of politics, 
especially national, as we call it here, they are called politics, economic, and foreign. Secondly, I looked at the evolution during the day, at three points in time of the day. Mid-morning, once the folks in the online newsroom had time to provide sort of basically more and more stories for their online edition in the <coughs> middle of the afternoon and at the end of the day, right? And then, just this was for online, I looked at the following day print edition of the top two newspapers to see whether there were any relation. Basic findings. First off, the baseline, of the baseline level of shared stories is already very high, right? Unlike print, so we start with basically one in two being shared. However, between the morning and the afternoon, there is no major significant, statistically significant change. However, in the evening, that raises 4%, which is from a baseline of you know, almost 40, basically 49%, 4% is quite a lot. It's never going to go much higher than that. So basically, we see a thematic convergence in the news agenda, right, unfolding in real time during a 24-hour cycle. Unlike print, thematically this affects far more what we would call non-public affairs stories, which is basically in the following order, sports, entertainment, and crime. Finally, one thing we looked at is if we take the evening edition of online, 10 p.m., and the following day edition right, of print, basically it, it reaches consumers eight hours later, how many of the stories that I have in print in day two have been anticipated by eight hours or more online, between 50 and 60% within each newspaper, and a lot of cross-anticipation, which tells me that there is, a, as I said, really a very dense web of shared content among the top two players in the country, which have far more than 50% of political power to set the news agenda. So what does this mean? One that technology and certain technical practices are essential to understand what's going on. But it's not technology per se, the change. It's how technology is used. Five years of having online didn't make any difference for print. It was only after online began to be used for certain purposes that that ended up affecting the general print. Secondly, and again, in the House of Comparative Media Studies, the relational lens is critical to understand what's going on in today's media environment. It's impossible to just focus on print or online or television. We need to understand the relationships of, of this. And finally, why, why do I make so much of technology? Before doing this study, I spent together with a team of researchers in Argentina nine months inside the online newsroom of the top players here. And one of the things that we found is that there is a, a great intensification of the monitoring practices of people in the newsroom of what their competitors are doing and what the entire media environment looks like at any given point in time. That is, reporters, editors have always looked at the competition. Now they look at the competition every five minutes, every 10 minutes, obsessively, all the time. They look all the time and they have the mandate of having a very complete picture of the day's news. So if they see in their competitors something that they don't have, right, their bosses are not gonna be happy so basically, they take that story and publish it elsewhere, but still on the home page. Right? So what that means is that over the course of the day, everybody is tired of having the same news. Right? So breaking news all the time online basically has eased the barrier of access to the information about the competitors. And what that has meant right, is that that has increased the process of imitation right? and the level of, of shared content of, of homogeneity in the product, just to give you a little bit of the text. Reporters monitor to make sure that they have a complete picture. As the editor of two minutes, as, as the editor of the economic section of uh, this online newspaper says, I look to the uh, other online news sites all the time. I don't want to miss anything that they have. If something has been missed, they put it. So the editor of the Urban Beat says, if a piece of news that has been published by the competition, then we also have to publish it. Perhaps it is not very important, so we lower it, we put it on other parts of the homepage, but we publish it anyway. If they have it, we have to have it too. And they monitor before and after they publish. Before they publish to calibrate the framing of the story, right? So, talking about sort of a high profile story, one uh, reporter from politics section, national in this country, we would be called, told us, looking at the competition is unavoidable. 
When we defined the headline and the lead of these stories before we published, the first thing we did was to check at our competitors to see if they are friendly. We do this almost automatically. And after they publish, to assess their performance vis-a-vis -vis those of their competitors. So for instance, this is from one of the field notes. At 6.13 p.m., a local cable news channel announces a verdict of the Michael Jackson trial, which triggers an intense rush in the newsroom to publish the story. Seven minutes later, because this is very, very, very fast, the updated story is published. The editor looks immediately at the size of their competitors and says, we'll publish it first. The homepage editor congratulates him, shakes his hand and says something along the lines of, great to work with you. <laughs> All right, methodology, I won't bother you. Again, why my newspapers oh. matter less than before? Because they have themselves commodified one of their distinctive contributions to society, hard news. This runs the risk of decreasing their power to set the agenda and their ability to contribute to a diverse public sphere. You might think this is only Argentina. It's in many cases a weird country down there in the real south. But as the folks on the project of, for the excellence in journalism said in the State of News Media Report 2006, the new paradox of American journalism is more outlets covering fewer stories, right? Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess the, the first thing I'd point out, uh, just on what Pablo just said, is that uh, we're, we're, we're uh, some colleagues of mine are coming out with a book on local television news that shows that actually at local television news in the United States, the homogeneity is it's breathtaking. <coughs> it's, it's frightening. Uh, but hey, if you watch local TV news, you know that already, right? Uh, for, first, first, let me thank, uh, thank uh, David for having me here on MIT. Uh, the website for this forum said that it was going to have media critics, working journalists, and uh, online visionaries. For the record, I'm, I'm a member of the first two camps. I'm not a member of the third camp. But uh, seeing as I'm from Washington and visionaries are in short supply down there, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> uh, when we start, before we start, I just want to do a couple things just to get an idea of your, your media consumption habits. Uh, and this is probably not an average audience, even by the highly erudite standards of Greater Boston. But uh, how many of you in the last two days read a newspaper for news? Okay, how many of you got some news from local or national television news? Or cable news? Okay, uh, how many of you went to a big website, New York Times, CNN.com, Boston.com? And how many of you went to a blog for news? All right. The point of this is that, it, look, our media consumption habits are increasingly very complicated. Okay, we're, we're all omnivores now. Okay, we're media omnivores. We go all over the place for our news. And the way to look at this kind of this moment in history right now, and, and I think, uh, I hope moments to come, is this is a very good time to be a news consumer. It's the best. Uh, you can go umpteen places for news, national and international. And you really control your news diet. If you want to spend the day on ESPN, you know, just reading and knowing every little bit of minutia about sports, you can. If you want to go to bbc.com, you can do that. If you want to go and scatter around, you can do that too. But this is also a difficult time to be a news consumer because all, that, all those possibilities mean that you really have to monitor your diet closely. It's really easy to kind of you know, wander down the, the news junk food aisle and just stuff your mouth with ho-hos if that's what you want to do. <laughs> it's possible. Uh, and whether or not newspapers survive or not, I actually think this is going to continue to be the case. I think we're going to be continue. We're going to be a mixed. We're going to be omnivores. We're going to be getting a little bit from different places, a little bit from here, a little bit from there. I don't. I, I completely agree with Jerome about blogs. I, I don't think. I, I think it's wrong to think that blogs are going to replace newspapers. But I think that, you know, they make the news environment richer. I think there's no question about that. But the idea that top-down media is just going to suddenly disappear with you know, assignment desks uh, or their equivalent and reporters and editors and people touching your people, a lot of hands on the copy before you see it, uh, I think that's going to continue. It's just going to live alongside other things. Uh, the question of whether, in, in my opinion, the question of whether newspapers are going to survive is obviously a provocation. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's such a broad question that, you know, the answer is yes. In some sense, I think newspapers will survive. I, I don't know what they're going to look like. I don't know if they're going to be on paper. I don't know what they're going to cover topically or geographically. 
And I think uh, the biggest question is, I don't know how they're going to fund the coverage that they do. Uh, there are real challenges on all those fronts. Newsprint, uh, as you probably know, is expensive, and delivery of the newspaper is not the most efficient you know, system in the world. A, a kid coming by and throwing a paper at your door is its nice. I, I get my newspaper that way. But it, it's not the most efficient way of getting the newspaper. Metro areas, and this is important, I think, for local news, are harder to cover than ever because they sprawl. You know, you know Greater Boston extends to New Hampshire. Uh, so how does the Boston Globe cover all that? It's, it's, it gets very complicated. I mean, it, those people up there may want the Boston Globe because they want the national news, but can they really feel they're getting the local news they need in there? It's, a very, it's, it's complicated. It's very difficult for the Globe or for any big metro daily to do that. And on top of all this, revenues are down in newspapers, and they continue to go. I, I mean, they're, 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 they're inching slightly upward, but they're, if you look at it over you know, long term, they were going like this. They're creeping up now. And that's for a lot of reasons. One of them is falling readership, which I'm sure we all know about. Uh, the best case scenario for newspaper readership over the coming years is a, one, is a slow and steady 1% decline for newspapers. That's the best case. That's what we're hoping for. Um, how does the web fit in all this? Uh, it hurts and it helps. Obviously, you know, more eyes see the content from newspapers, and this is a good thing. Uh, uh, the bad parts, there are a lot of them. Uh, online is killing newspapers where classified ads are concerned. That was a steady stream of income that's gone. Uh, all those people who read the newspaper for free, it, it's, it's not clear that it's a large number yet. It's somewhere around, I think, 6 or 7% that, don't, that read, it, but, uh, read it online but don't get it delivered or, or read the hard copy. That's money that's lost in terms of subscription revenue. Uh, one thing we cite in the report is if online and print ad rates stay where they are, uh, you know, it, it's, if the idea that the, well, online revenues will increase at some point and it'll be a nice stream of money and it'll be able to fund all that wonderful reporting you get, it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, it, our estimates are, uh, somebody else's estimates that we count on are, if they stay where they are, if rates stay where they are, they would have to grow at a rate of 33% till the year 2017 just to make up for where things are right now. That means that, uh, you know, it's going to be hard times for all in the newspaper industry. And that brings us to the, the big question, so what? What if there were no more newspapers? And uh, we'll get into this tonight. And I think actually that just hearing people talk, there's more agreement on this than, uh, than you might think. But um, I'll throw out a few things why I think newspapers are critical. Newspapers are, at the, la at the local and the national level, the place with the most bodies. It's, got the most, it's the newspaper that has the most reporters on the street. More, it, there may be more people that watch local TV news, but in terms of having people out there getting the news, it's the newspaper that has the most people. What does that mean? That means that they have beat reporters who have a certain amount of expertise and who know what the heck they're talking about. Uh, I... Uh, there, there's some feeling among bloggers, and I know because I write things, and <laughs> I write things in my column, and I have an email where people can get in touch with me, and you, you know, you, you get flames from people through the email. Uh, I think blogs actually do a pretty good job of covering big stories, and it's uh, for the for the reason Jerome was saying. I think that they that basically blogs largely feed off what's out there. They take the news that's out there. They they tell you what they think of it. Maybe they poke holes in it. Maybe it's another set of eyes that has problems with something that's out there but the story's already out there. They're not very good at breaking something. They're not going to break news, and that's because, you know, they're not... Bloggers aren't going to be walking around the Justice Department, you know, for free, okay? They're not just going to give up whatever they do and, like, well, I'm just going to go, you know, stand over at the Department of Interior for a while and see what I pick up and then put it on my blog because nobody's going to want to read that. It's only interesting when something happens at the Department of the Interior, but to know what's really going on, you have to have somebody there to figure it out. Unfortunately, increasingly, newspapers don't have those people there because of staff cuts, and that's an issue. Uh, number two, I think despite all the grumblings about bias from the left and right in the newspaper, and I think some of it, you know, that's, that's par for the course, uh, you know, the, 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 those lovable mainstream journalists do at least try to get the story straight. I do think they're trying to get the story straight. I don't think they willingly spin readers. I think they get spun. I think it happens, and I think it's going to happen all the time. They're human beings. It's going to continue. But 
if you think that, well, okay, so we'll go with bloggers, we'll go with citizen journalists as a replacement of newspaper people, or a replacement of newspapers, you know, they cover what they cover a lot of times because, uh, A, they're, they're, they care very deeply about the issue and they would like to see it turn out one way or the other, which means they're going to have a certain thing they'd like to say or a certain spin they'd like to put on it. Or sometimes they actually have a dog in the fight and there's nothing wrong with that as long as you know it. But what you end up with, if that's what everybody starts doing, is you have a world full of electronic equivalents of the nation or, or, or the national review. And I think that's interesting. I just think it can't be the sole way we get news. You know, it, 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 the, you know, if that was the world, whether you sit on the left or the right, at some point you'd have to wonder, you know, where the truth lies, or especially if you sit in the middle. Uh, uh, in other words, there's something to be said for the pursuit of objectivity. Three, and uh, this is a big one, and this goes to what David was saying uh, early on. Uh, because, and this comes back to the beginning, because the news environment is so complicated now, and because we're all omnivores, you need somebody to make sense of it. You need a guide. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to take their, you don't have, you don't have to take their vision of everything at face value. You don't have to say, well, the most important story of the day is Mark Foley because the New York Times said it was the most important story of the day. But at some point, you're probably interested to find out what a bunch of people who just look at the news all the time and go through the stories and try to figure out what the biggest news of the day is, you're probably curious to see what they think it is. Maybe after you go and look at the things in particular that you're interested in. Uh, the strength of a newspaper is really its collective knowledge. It's all these people who may not be experts in areas, but who have, who have knowledge in them. And I, you know, I may know more, or you may know more than your favorite or least favorite reporter about the thing that you care about. But collectively, the newspaper actually has a lot of knowledge that they can put together in mind to try to figure out what's really important every day. I'll stop because I want to stay short. Uh, but, but I want to put one important caveat on all this. While we're talking about newspapers, I think it's important not to get caught up in the paper aspect of it. <laughs> the important thing is that somebody is doing these things that I just talked about. And it may be that it's going to end up being electronic. It may be some other, some other form that it comes to you by. But the delivery system to me isn't important. What's really important is providing the things that we talked about. And, and I, think, I think most important, finding an economic model that really makes that possible. Because right now, the economic no model for online, there's just there's a lot of stuff out there. But there isn't funding, really, to have the reporters, the, to have the, the base of reporters you'd need to go out and kind of gather the news you want in a newspaper. And let's just leave it at that and hear what you have to say. This is the audience's turn. I count on your being articulate and concise. Uh, come down to these two microphones if you have questions or comments, not just questions. We, 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 wel we welcome your, your uh, um, argumentative sides as well as, as, well as, as, well as questions. Uh, uh, I, I thought, uh, while, while you're sort of gathering your thoughts, I, I, I thought I might give uh, each of the panelists a chance to respond quickly to what they heard their colleagues say. So, Pablo, let's start with you. Do you have any responses that you'd like to offer? No, it's more commentary than responses. I mean, the issue of the economic model for online is a big issue, right? What, what we don't have to forget is that now most sites that are well run margin that are much higher than those of their print counterparts. The problem is that the volume right. is very low. So we are talking about a business that as a business would be satisfactory for most entrepreneurs, but it's not satisfactory for a very large right, company and company that has been used to enjoy an incredibly sort of uh, handsome profit margin, right, with a very, very large volume for a long time. Right. Right, so, and uh, th that's, so, because several years ago, people used to say, oh, nobody's making money on the web with news, but now they are making money, they're making good money, uh, proportionally speaking. The problem is the, is the size, right? Right, right. The volume well, of and they are, and a lot of times they're getting their content from their, you know, they're drawing the content from the, um, from the print side and, and yeah. Right, and we'll get there. Yeah. Dante, let's be sure when you speak that it I'm picks sorry. up the mic, or turn the mic toward you when you speak, so make sure we get it on re recording. Yeah, let me co continue on, on, on uh, the, the commodified nature of, of the news, I think is really interesting because it's sort of corollary to what I was bringing up of, of what, you know, a progressive might feel earlier this decade is the non, non, 
not enough representation of their, their viewpoints. And I think it, um, it's something that, that we can probably criticize newspapers in general as lacking in, in, in that commercialization of that commodification of it points to um, the lack which I, I pointed out at the end of the uh, talk I gave, which, which is community. And that's another reason why people are turning to other sources other than newspapers. The, the authority aspect is a, is, a, is a really interesting model because, you know, what there are, I think there's actually a little more breakdown we need to do with that is that you have authorities of people who are like-minded with you, people you turn to as sort of an ally, and then you have authority figures that, that society puts up as uh, relating to the general information flow that, that we go into. And I think newspapers are, pro are more of the latter and typically those are, those are things that are being deconstructed more and more as people turn to more of the former, getting it online, and blogs are a great representation of that, of people being able to form their own authority leaders and their own networks there that are shared with other community members. Uh, just to touch on that, I mean, I, I agree. I think that uh, when, when you're talking about, particularly about politics, where I think blogs are very strong, uh, th there's knowledge out there in, the, in, those, in those blogs that, that, that maybe the reporter doesn't have. I, I, what I'm trying to say about what the newspaper does have is for you to get everything you'd, you'd get in the newspaper or from a, from a major media organization as a big reporting staff is you'd need to go to a blog about politics. Then you'd need to go to a blog about what? Asian affairs. Then you'd need to go to a blog about what's going on in Europe. Then you'd need to go to a blog about what's going on in health care. It, it gets very complicated. The, the thing the newspaper does is it, it takes all these people aggregates them in one place. And I think if you have specific areas of interest, yeah, you're going to go to blogs and you're going to get, you, you know, if you want in-depth political coverage, I think a lot of times you can get some of it on the newspaper, but I think, yeah, you're going to go to blogs to supplement that. I just think, you know, the idea that we'd all go through, you know, a blog for every kind of topic in the newspaper, it'd just be, it's just too damn <laughs> time-consuming. Question here. Um, I want to pick up on that point and the point, Mr. Tinney, that you made uh, uh, towards the end, which is that uh, even if you get rid of the form of the newspaper, you didn't have a newspaper and you didn't have delivery trucks and you didn't have ink and everything else, you would still have enormous value in the resources of the newspaper that no blog can replicate. And it, it seems to me what's happening, at least in some cases, is that uh, uh, newspapers are migrating into an electronic format. I read the Wall Street Journal every day, but I haven't picked up the newspaper itself in, in weeks. I read it online because it's organized that way. Uh, no blog can, can replace the Wall Street Journal, but, but the electronic format is quickly replacing the newspaper format, it seems to me. And I wonder if you or the other panelists <clears throat> Would, would sort of talk about this middle uh, area <clears throat> that's not a traditional newspaper, but certainly not a blog. It's the newspaper uh, that is uh, uh, delivered in the uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an electronic format. Uh, well, really quickly, I mean, the journal is an interesting example because uh, it, it has one huge advantage that most of the other online newspapers don't. It charges for content, and it's and it's and it's such a specialized. I mean, people. The journal means something special. People get it, and they feel they get. They're willing to pay that. You know, the other, the only, you know, the Times has kind of crept into it by you know, asking you to pay for columnists, which uh, surprisingly has worked. I, be honest, I never thought that would work, but they're actually they've done pretty well with it, uh, and they offer some archival stuff and things like that. You know, the, the question is, I do think I do think that newspapers are going to migrate that way, and then I also think at some point, I'd be curious to hear what, what the other panelists thought, but you know. Video, these things are going to, it's all going to merge. There will be, there will be a, 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 you know, some kind of great convergence down the road. It's already, if you talk to photographers at newspapers, they're being given video cameras. They don't shoot as much anymore. They take video. And the, the, the quality, they're, they're able to do frame grabs from the video they shoot that's so good, they, they don't need the camera anymore. So what does this do? Well, it, a, they still can run the photos in the online edition, but they also have this video of the event that they can put up that actually can make them compete a little bit with television. It, it, uh, Anyway, I, I do think it's moving that way. I just think it's a question of uh, it's, it's a question of uh, finding a way to pay for it for the outlets. Sure. Well, what it brings out to me is like what 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 are we going to drop off if we if um, you know what's going to left in the, the waste basket of basket of history if a newspaper stop in in the paper format specifically because re replacing it online in the digital format is increasingly what's going to happen. 
that what's going to drop off is this structured format of how the news is presented to everybody. And, and it has been this one-size-fits-all model with the paper newspaper that is ending. And I don't think there's any way that that's going to uh, get turned back. Even the newspapers that people are going to be getting um, at a certain point here, it's going to be like that Harry Potter movie where you know you unroll something and it's all digital and it, it's just like a, a digital paper that uh, changes and it, the delivery of these things day to day is going to become a relic. Um, I don't think that's a, a that that seems to me irre, irrevocable change that's going to happen. The online. Uh, news vehicle that people are going to use is also going to become more and more customized according to your delivery. That Even the Wall Street Journal, they can find out more and more about you and deliver the ads that they want you to uh, see based upon your consumer profile. That's not a trend that's going to stop either. So the thing that, you know, I believe is that is really what, what newspapers symbolize here that is going to change is this one-size-fits-all broadcast medium consumption that's represented uh, most dramatically with the online culture as far as how it's changing. One, one comment to add to the observation. In the transition from print to online, you don't take the same content and put it in a different delivery vehicle. Because the times and places and modes of consumption, right, and the ways in which users or readers engage with the different media are different. What has been happening over the past four or five years is that most of the news online gets consumed during regular work hours. Right? If you look at right, the evolution yeah. of, the, of the traffic over the 24-hour cycle, right, it is flat more or less from the wee hours in the morning until 8 or 9 in the morning. That starts to go up, right? and it stays very high up until 5 or 6 when it goes down. Right? So Pablo, the implication is instead of working, people are going online to read the newspaper? <laughs> oh, they're working exactly. online. <laughs> so people are working with computers, they're working online, they're checking the news, but they're doing something else. They have very little time, right? So, right, they, on the consumer side, they're doing many things, their attention is divided, they want quick sound bites, or so the common wisdom says. On the journalistic side, it means that you're constantly urged to feed, right, the consumers with the information. So you don't have two hours to go to a particular neighborhood to source your story, to come back, think about it, write, give it to your copy editor, etc. Et that you have 20 minutes from start to finish. In the research that I was referring to, when we spent nine months inside this online newspaper, one thing we looked at was time of production. Right? From start to finish, 95% of the stories were produced in less than half hour. Okay. Now, well, what this <laughs> means is that, and there, there are okay, many other things having to do with the different media that people use, video, audio, etc. But what this means is that in the transition from this to this, the, way of, the ways of crafting a story change. What kinds of stories we can tell change. Right? How we tell those stories, how the stories are consumed, appropriated, circulate in the blog sphere, all that changes. Right? So newspapers are but print, but they also stand for certain ways of journalism, certain ways of in which the media contribute to society. And that's in part what is in question in this transition. Right? Not just it's not just oh instead of getting it here, I get it here. Right? Question here. Um, I bet is that on? Can we hear her? In the back, can you hear the speaker? Ask again. Baby form. 
What is the newspaper? <laughs> Very difficult question. Well, uh, I think I think a newspaper. That's what I mean. We can't get we can't get caught up in the idea that a newspaper uh, a newspaper is an organization full of people that put out a product that you read every day. That's really what a newspaper is. A newspaper really isn't the isn't the newsprint that gets on your fingers and all that stuff. Google News is interesting because I like Google News a lot. I, but but Google News couldn't exist without the mainstream media. It just goes in and grabs stories, and I think it's very interesting. I, I like it, you know, and, and I have a couple of RSS feeds, and, uh, you know, but, but, it, but it's cannibalizing, I mean, it's cannibalizing, you know, it's taking stories from the old media, okay, and it's, and it's giving them to you in a new format. But it's still, the I, to me, that's still, you know, the newspaper, or, or if you're getting it from a broadcast company, it's, bro it's, the, it's you know, it's ABC or it's CNN. Yeah, David's got a really good point, because uh, I'm... Dante, I mean, it's, it's because the newspapers, I mean, Google couldn't exist with that. I love that thing, too. It could not exist if people like Dante weren't out on the street, you know, doing the reporting. Not on the street? Okay. All right. Good for him. Now he's a columnist. He's opining now. But he Literally, I mean, you know, so I, I, I think you have to probably step back and, un, and unfold that. Well, if, and if Google's not really supporting that model financially, and they're not, they're just feeding off it. That's the point of truth. And so are a lot of aggregators online. What's going to keep that model profitable and up and standing for them to feed off it? There's, there's no commercialization happening between Google and everything that it links to. Yeah, just one, one comment on the Google News that is important and relevant to the question of what is the newspaper. The newspaper, in addition to the things that Dante mentioned, the newspaper is an organization that specializes in editorial judgment, right? And in selecting from all the potential events happening in, say, 24 hours or a week uh, period of time, which ones are newsworthy, and of those that are newsworthy, which kind of angle, et cetera, et cetera. Google has an algorithm. So difference between Google and a newspaper is that there is nobody actually looking at this story versus that story. It's an algorithm that selects on the basis of certain criteria, right? what kind of news get delivered in what kind of position on the home page. What is interesting is that that kind of reasoning, the mixing of the human and the software, is also happening at traditional newspapers. So for example, Le Monde has an in-house built software that assists its editors online to select and rotate the stories on its site during the day, depending on the number of patterns or issues having to do with traffic, what stories get you know more traffic than they are moved up automatically, or they're suggested to the editors that they should go up, etc. etc. So a newspaper among other things is an organization that specializes in editorial decision making. Part of the transformation that is happening from print to online is that, that editorial decision making in part is being done in conjunction with software. Right? written in part with editorial premises, but where the editorial premises are very much set from the beginning and with the human element of reacting in an improvised way and having that sort of feeling for the news right, uh, disappears. So that's another important thing to keep in mind in the current context. I have a question about the economic model. It sounds like everyone's trying to we know that there are big changes happening, but we don't know what the economic model is going to look like. And um, I'm curious about your thoughts on if one thing that's hurting newspapers is the move to online. Another, it seems to me, is the sort of expectations about revenue. Newspapers were wonderful investments for a while when they were generating 20 percent. Um, Wall Street loved them, and so a lot of them are now public companies. That clearly is difficult to maintain, and you see some conversations happening now about taking them private or um, taking them in the hands of local investors who wouldn't have those same expectations. And I'm just curious if your thoughts how that would affect this, um, the pressures they're in. Would that allow, would that just sort of stave off some of these changes, or would that give them some breathing room um, to live a little longer? Unlike the newspaper industry, newspaper industry and newspaper companies in other countries, for instance, in Latin America, where they still remain privately owned, mostly family owned enterprises, 
right? So there are shared uh, much more con fluctuations in the marketplace. Newspapers in the state decided a few decades ago to fund expansion through the capital markets. And that was wonderful for a certain period of time, but the capital markets have certain sort of dynamics and that they, among other things, a very short term view of performance. And that is hurting the newspapers now because they are not performing as well as other competitors. They are performing <coughs> remarkably well when one compares that with other sort of mature industries. Right? But they are not performing as well as some competitors. So it is important in terms of the economic model, yes, to think about what are the consequences uh, of the, the, the important presence of the capital markets in the industry and what could be done or could not be done in going forward. The other thing that I think is important to keep in mind, or at least the way I think about this issue, and I'm not an expert in this, but I spent some time thinking about newspapers in general, is that a century ago, that is, you know, 1960, say, um, the traditional media owned a lot, right, a very significant portion of the information environment, right? right? There were a few companies which owned a lot. Now, traditional media are not, no longer, they no longer have this dominant position in the information environment. The, the, the market value of Google or some of the new competitors far surpasses that of many traditional companies even jointly put together. So in a sense, what has happened is that newspapers as one sort of expression of traditional media have in general receded in their position in the marketplace, right? In the information marketplace because the things that we used to do separately in the past. Now we do all together. We get our news, we search online, we watch video, we get movie tickets. We all do that in the convergent sort of information environment. So what in part is hurting newspapers is the fact that overall they have a much less controlling position of the entire information environment and they have much less room to maneuver. Yeah, I have a comment. Um, as somebody who, re who reads the Globe in paper and the Times online and pays for both because I think I ought to pay for it, um, my concern isn't the change in technology. I don't care whether it's on paper or it's online, but I care a lot about interface. I mean, coincidentally, I'm an interface designer. But, um, <laughs> but it, the role of serendipity, and I have just two examples. On the rare case when I pick up the New York Times on paper and I read it, I'll leaf through and I will see an opera review, and I'll read an opera review, and I'll be in, enlightened by it, I will never click on the music section of the online times. And the other example, it's coincident that Alex Beam just stepped forward because I was going to use him as, as an example, is in the paper I read his column, I enjoy it, I get pissed off by it about half the time. <laughs> but because, I, um, because he has good lead-ins and good headlines, it usually draws me in. But because he pisses me off about half the time, I might not click to it. And I might not, therefore, get exposed to something that would annoy me. Um, and I really mean that as a compliment, by the way, I think. And I appreciate that you're provocative. Um, and when you couple that with Pablo's point about the, the commodification, and I just worry about uh, our culture becoming the lens through which we view the world getting smaller and smaller and flatter and flatter. Um, and it doesn't just apply to news, but it, it's, but, but it certainly applies to news. It doesn't just apply to it, but it certainly applies to news. And none of the uh, panaceas that have been proposed have addressed that concern for me. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that's just a comment. Dante. Uh, well, I think it most importantly actually applies to news because it's, it's ultimately news is how you define your reality. So if we're all going to go out and get our different pictures, I mean, we all have to some extent a different picture of reality. But, but I mean, if we all start going off in completely just crazy divergent directions, democracy becomes much harder because uh, we can, we're debating things that should be facts. <laughs> we're, we do a little bit of this now, actually, but, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it, it could get much worse, uh, and I agree. Uh, the, the serendipity factor, I think, is a big point. I, I, I do agree with that. The, the one thing about moving to online, um, and, and I agree with Jerome, that uh, you, you're going you're gonna to seek out the stories you want. They are still going to have that front page when you go to the first page of that site where they're going to try to tell you something. There'll be some chance maybe that you'll get a little bit of serendipity there. But um, it's interesting. The New York Times new website uh, has all these tabs at the top, and they're not all functional yet. But one of them is just called My Times. And I assume this is going to be some kind of uh, some ability to do, uh, do more customization. 
uh, it's not functioning yet. I'm curious to see what it's going to look like, but, but a little bit of it would be lost then. I mean, th th that's what I mean a little bit about the news judgment of those people. Y you don't have to. The nice thing about online is you could, you'll, you'd still be able to see some of it on that front page, maybe not as much. You can still ignore their news judgment. I mean, believe me, people do all the time. You know, but, but uh, I think it's nice to have it out there just to see what somebody else thinks is, is important. Alex. You know, participating in, in politics, I think I see the, you know, the, the definitely the creating of realities out there, the living by different realities. You can see it online. You can see it right now. With this, the story that's breaking with Mark Foley, you can go to right-wing sites and you just see a completely different picture of reality than if you went to uh, progressive blogs. Where I tend to do when I go into the mainstream media is looking to see what you know what what worldview are they buying into, and, it, and it's on one level it's a rather cynical attitude, but I think on another level the participatory nature of it means that a lot more people are participating in that political structure. Um, they might be doing it from very partisan perspectives or very oriented towards their own needs, but d democracy usually is pretty d pretty messy when a lot of people get involved. We'll just keep it online, we'll be all right. <laughs> Can I add one, one sort of data point to your comment? I don't have figures for sort of the leading papers in the States, but for the two newspapers that I looked at and I've done extensive research on in Argentina, if you look at the total number of clicks on any given day, one page gets between 50 and 60 percent, and that is the home page. Okay. So you, eh, these newspapers have every day 100,000 pages available to the consumer. The consumers click on one between 50 and 60 percent of the time, which means that they, what they have, there is no serendipity. What they have there is what they see 50 to 60 percent of the time. So your concern about serendipity is important, important one, because what is not there likely will go unseen, much more proportionally than in the world of print. Right. Alex Beam. Um, perhaps I, I should mention that Alex spoke at our first forum. He's a columnist for the Boston Globe. Right, I work for a newspaper. <laughs> I, I, not, maybe I, not much longer, though, Alex. <laughs> I, I really, my question is direct solely at, at Jerome, which is the reason I came here. And um, I, I, I'm, I want to, I totally, empathize with your comments about the lack of progress, progressivity in the mainstream media. There's, there's, it's, it's almost complete. But can you talk to us for a while about net roots and political power? Because I feel like I've been on the receiving end, and I remember the <laughs> excitement around Dean and the online excitement around Dean. And um, it sort of faded out. And I, I got really caught up in the Lamont thing, where net roots and its sort of, you know, outriders seem to have played a fascinating role. And now I'm, there's this possibility that uh, Lamont might lose to the machine. And I, could you speak for a while about um, progressive politics um, and, and the internet? Sure. The, um, you know, when I worked on Howard Dean's campaign up in, up in Burlington and uh, um, after, after he crashed and burned in, in Iowa, there was a lot of stories like, you know, is this a dot, like a dot-com boom or boom bus cycle of uh, online Netroots politics. And of course it wasn't, you know, those people are still clicking away and, and in, in fact in much greater numbers right now. I think what we're seeing here though is, is something that's uh, going through stages of growth and getting pushed back from, you know, an establishment. Um, the, for me, the, What's happened over the, and I would largely say that this, what I call the net roots movement has happened this decade. And it has increased in numbers, um, even in this last six months, the amount of pe part people participating in the blogs. I mentioned that, uh, the traffic earlier at 120 million page views for the month right now. Previous to Lamont, it was at about 60 or 70 million. So it's nearly doubled in the last five or six months. I think the Lamont race, and this was, um, Ned Lamont in Connecticut, who run, won the primary against Joe, Lam Joe Lieberman, really showed that the, the progressive movement that is gathering steam online has the power now to affect politics in the Democratic Party at the electoral level. And up to that point, it had not been possible. The, the reality comes crashing in when you, when, you, when you consider that, yes, you can do it in the, in the primary election, but the net roots are probably not strong enough to do that at the 
general election when independents and, and Republicans are, you know, voting just just alongside the Democrats. It's a much more partisan atmosphere. But I don't really view the, the Lamont uh, election as a do or die movement for the net roots because I don't, I don't believe the net roots is going away. The, this this process that has started online of people regaining control of the Democratic Party, engaging in par uh, politics online, is not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay with us. And whether or not Lamont loses, whether or not the Democratic Party regains control, that's not going to change. That's going to keep going with us. The, the one thing I, I'd like to point out, though, in terms of like you know what's changed over the last couple of years is that in the 2003 cycle, you had a lot of big blogs that were more nationally oriented towards the presidential race. This cycle, what we're seeing being developed a lot more is what I call local blogosphere. And these will be blogs that are within a state. And you have that here in Massachusetts. There's a number of blogs that, that joined together and had a conference called Blog Left um, late last year. And they've participated in a, in a number of other activities. And so you create this sort of local blogosphere that exists within the, you know, the wider progressive infrastructure but it's part of a more local effort, and, and, and what we're seeing now is that the candidates are able to um, reach out to these people and engage with them, help them with their turnout the vote exercises and, and engage in politics on a real grassroots, on-the-ground level. All that is just, you know, from, from the perspective of uh, someone who likes it when people get involved in politics, just great. It's something that's going to be with us until we say, but, you know, the ups and downs of the victories and whatnot are, are going to um, stick around with us. And, um, any follow-up, or is that sort of along the discussion? Okay. Um, I have a question that's sort of a follow-up on the question, what are newspapers, what is a newspaper, and get me thinking what, what is the audience uh, about, um, I don't know, it's been over 10 years ago, I was in this building doing research on customized news uh, as part of a research program called the News, News in the Future program. And at the time, uh, talking about the Daily Me and customized news was uh, very criticized and um, we were talking about the loss of serendipity. And um, But now many years have passed and um, I'm still wondering what is audience when you say that uh, uh, newspapers have editors who have an expertise in identifying stories, and um, but that's because they identify the stories based on an audience and to target a certain audience. But then, how do you define audience? It's, it seems like audience is something very diverse and hard to. Like I was born in Colombia, I grew up in France, and I'm here now, and I'm interested in all those countries. But I, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm. Representative, but I'm just saying everybody has a different background and different interests. So, I'll, I'll start off on this. Well, what you know, this points out earlier is what is lost is you know with this customized news trend that we're having, what is lost is a centralized sort of broadcast um, message that's going out there to people. And and I don't really blame. I mean, it sort of sounds like we're kind of victimizing you know the the, the broadcast medium thing. But I think um, you know Pablo pointed out that the problem that was was created with this. In, in the beginning because they were not delivering what people wanted. They were, they were delivering more of something that's been commodified for consumption in an in a easy, well, recognizable focus. And from a political standpoint, they were creating things that were advocating uh, something that was I, what I view a lot of times as be right-wing propaganda because they were being so pressured by those forces that wanted to control the debate. I guess the thing I'd say about uh, about editors and, and uh, expertise and, and whatnot is uh, I don't I, I usually I think when you it depends on the news organization but if you get to the right news organization I don't think that they put stories on the front page for their audience I think maybe they'll put one story on the front page it's a crowd pleaser or something like that but if you looked at the front page of like of, of, of the Globe or the Times or the Washington Post, those stories are up there because a bunch of people all sat around. And it's not that they're not that they're experts on everything, but they have all these people, you know, coming back to them and saying, "This is going on where I am. This is going on where I am. This is going on where I am." And it's like, "Well, why is that important? Why is that important? Why is that important?" And they sit and they they take all that into account. And they're like, "Based on everything I've heard, these are the five biggest stories of today." 
you know, and maybe plus the story about a lost dog or something that'll that'll get that that truly is there. Just like you know, it's a it's it's a good read. It's a crowd pleaser, but I, but I really don't think that they put the stories in the front page just because they're trying to attract audience. I think that they're doing it because they think this isn't true of all places. And actually, I would say this: it's less true in broadcast, and that's probably my bias as a print guy. But but I really do think when they put those front pages together, they're 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 putting the stories up there that they think are the most important. I would like to read about the translator. And they are a very special kind of audience in that way. And to a certain extent, the news that they produce, that they communicate, reflects their own self-perception of an intended audience. So one. Two, um, it is another important thing, as Andrew said, that newspapers are not here, or not, do not exist in society to tell us what we want to know, necessarily, but they what should. we should know Right? That we may not care about, but it's important that as citizens of a particular country or people who live in a particular locality, we should know. And that's a very, very important function that they play. Now, in the world in which, 90, for instance, in the States, 97% of newspapers operate in natural monopoly markets, that is, they have no other local competitors, right? And in which Newspaper people get aggregate circulation figures about how much they are selling, and they may get some information in terms of focus groups about what people want and not want. And so they have a very vague and aggregate, right, aerial <coughs> conception of the audience or the audience response. It is easier to sustain this mission of saying, I'm going to tell you what you should know, not necessarily what you might want to know. Online, they have clicks, right? right? Right. And everybody clicks and everybody votes with their click. And people online and all the time not only monitor their competition, but how well or badly their stories are doing. And they are developing a much more refined taste, right? a much more refined sense, I'm sorry, of the taste of the audience. And so for instance, newspaper, newspapers in general for their top stories, they, they tend to be a heavy proportion of public affairs stories, right? national, foreign, etc. Most of what consumers want to read about as measured in terms of their clicks, is sports, entertainment, right, natural disasters, etc. Et <laughs> one, thing, one thing is when you have that vague idea from focus groups, surveys, but you don't see it every day with the clicking on your stories. But when you see that information every day, right, it creates a, a very important conflict that is pervasive in all the news <coughs> that I visited and the people that I talked to, which is between the daily me or the aggregation of the daily me as manifested in their clicks and the professional values, right? And the sense of purpose and the public service of the journalistic profession, which is a wonderful thing, right? So part of what's going on is that, right? I mean, it, it is true that the audience, right? I mean, it's a very complicated construct, etc., etc. but these technological changes in part and intentionally have revealed a certain dynamic that is much more difficult to avoid now than what it was before. And again, for organizations, we want to talk about Google News, Yahoo, etc., etc., which do not have these wonderful journalistic values, therefore they are going to deliver a whole lot of what the audience wants, not necessarily what they should know about, right? It's much easier to move in that direction, but for, for traditional media, it's much more difficult because it's a, it's, it's a value system, right? It's a cultural thing. So it is a very complicated issue. Let, let, let me mention people that uh, uh, I know some people have already left, and uh, we're going to have a very elegant reception after this event, uh, starting at 7 o'clock. All of you who are here are certainly invited, uh, and I hope you'll attend. Question here. Yeah, I have, I guess, two questions. Uh, is the traditional media ceding their expertise to make editorial judgment when they start feeding off each other? You know, who decides what a story is if everyone's just pointing at each other saying, we don't have it, we need to have that? Do they suddenly stop exercising judgment? And on the flip side of that, you know, Jerome, you talk about the, ex the two tiers of expertise, the, the familiar and then the authoritarian expertise. In the blogosphere, how do we vet experts? How do we say this guy really knows what he's talking about about Southeast Asia versus this person? Well, start with that last part. I, I think it comes through. Um the experts are basically known through their credibility, and, and it's you know the 
the unique thing about the internet is history sort of begins in the mid mid 1990s, and uh, you can you can go, um, you know, if you have an online record that's associated with you, people can find out about it in the past. But, but so many people, them. is the online record associated with them? I mean, so many people post anonymously. Oh yeah, well then you're, yeah, well so then you either are pretty skeptical of that. Um, thing that's posted, and, and that's sort of evolved over time. It used to be that, you know, when things would break, people would report them no matter who did the story, and it would be part of the cycle, but people got burned a couple times, especially, um, you know, people that were out there under their name who were taking anonymous uh, statements at their at their face value. That's, I think that's evolved over time, and especially from the perspective, Dante can speak to this, of a journalist that reads things out there. There's a, there's a much more skepticism that exists online now. But there is a, you know, the, the, the editorial judgment that you mentioned, um, you know, I see this playing out right now with the, with the Mark Foley scandal and that um, there's a lot of online uh, blogs and, and websites that are reporting on who the pages actually were. And these are minors that were involved with Mark Foley. These, and, and it's very explicit. You, you have pictures of the people, you have descriptions of where their jobs are now and everything, everything down to the detail. It isn't making it into the wider mainstream media, and I think that is, and it's not even making it into the log, low, uh, larger blogosphere, but it's definitely out there. So you have something of a, um, you know, we, I, t I think I tend to see the blogs as sort of like a gatekeeper, um, or having busted down the gatekeeper um, <coughs> presence of the mainstream media, but it's still very much in effect, and for sometimes, like this case, good reason. I think there'll always be gatekeepers. I mean, it's just going to be who's who's at you know, it's just who's at the gate. You know, somebody's going to be there, and maybe the gate's bigger or smaller or whatever, whatnot. Uh, the the Pablo study is really interesting about about um, about Argentina, just because it's it, it it's the I think the thing it most it, again the thing it most ties to the United States is local television because you have a market where you'll generally have at least three, maybe four stations doing the news at the same time. And you talk to somebody who's done local TV news, and they're watching the other newscast the entire time and writing down what's on there. In the morning, they get the ratings, they get the overnights the next morning, like, oh my God, this story didn't do well. Why'd this do this? We've got to move something else. It, it is a different, I mean, it works different than a newspaper. It, 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 it is much more of a commodity, local television news, than newspapers are, just because it's, it's the environment it exists in. And it, it's troubling if, that's, if that becomes the, the, the way online starts to operate, because it's a very bad, I mean, in terms of news judgment, it's just awful. It's gonna, it's gonna, it will, things will get commodified and it'll lead to a dumbing down. Isn't part of the problem though there that, I mean, in terms of what we're talking about tonight, the 30% the of people are online in Argentina. And if that number were a hot, lot higher, I wonder if we'd have these problems that you're, you're describing. Why? I, I, I want to make one comment, yeah, sure. but, but that, why? Because people wouldn't, I mean, I think if those papers had a lot more competition with online sources where their eyeballs were moving after them, that they wouldn't necessarily be replicating their stories. Because if they're going to start printing the same thing, it leaves a huge vacuum out there for other people to go into. Okay, so hold that thought for a second. I'm not sure about this one. <laughs> okay, I understand the question. Okay. So, um, editorial judgment is always a collective answer. Social enterprise. It's not that a newspaper is not composed with one. A newsroom has more than one person, right? And that and that judgment actually is a result of years of on-the-job socialization. In some cases, professional training, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What has been happening, though, is that the collective character of the judgment, right? There's always a tension between the collective and the individual or the organizational, right? What, what's going on is that there is more of an interorganizational convergence. That is leading to this judgment being more shared, right? So there, there has always been a collective component. Now it's more collective than before, but it's not that it wasn't collective before. One, two, two. That is very important. In this context, the role of the wire services becomes even more important than before, right? Because a greater proportion of what we see in the online press, right, in the online environment comes actually from the wires. And actually what happens is that the people in the newsroom, not only the people in the, in the online newsroom are watching each other, the people in the print newsroom are watching about the online are doing, right? And sometimes I've been told, 
but I haven't observed this directly, so I don't have systematic data. But sometimes even, instead of preparing their news budget by themselves, they actually grab, print out a couple of online pages from reputable sources, sometimes they're online newspaper, sometimes they're online newspaper, and they take that to the noon meeting in the newsroom, right? So, <coughs> because, again, it's easier to access that information and time constraints are, are very serious. So two things that think are happening is that the, the, the collective dimension of the editorial judgment is still editorial judgment because of a thousand possible stories, there are still, there are still five, six, seven, ten stories that are being chosen. So that is the expression of judgment. But the collective part right, is more important than before. And in a context in which there is, as Tom Rosenstein, for instance, and, 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 and the people at the project, for instance, in journalism has, has, have written a lot lately, the, in, in, in which the acceleration of the news cycle has deepened, there is less time, etc., etc., et and the reliance on wire services, right? It's even greater than before. We also rely on wire services before, but now it's even greater. So again, that is adding to the collective, right, nature of the, the, the enterprise. Um, go, going to your comment, it is. So one one way of thinking about it is, it is not only that it's twenty five percent, but it also that twenty five percent represents disproportionately a particular segment in the socioeconomic world. So that's that, right? I mean, you have the upper tier because in a country with you know levels of poverty that are incredibly high, uh, people who have access to the web, etc., etc., etc. So one would think it's not only that the pie, if the pie gets bigger, there are more resources, but also if the public gets more diverse, there should be more. I don't know. But what I do know, what I do know is, so remember I said I have data from 2004 and 2005. So, and I have, so basically the two are much more alive than before them, but I said really there is a growth between 04 and 05 in the convergence, right? So what we see is that the convergence has grown, right? And, right, at the same time, the amount of people who access the internet have grown, has grown. And the spreading in the so socioeconomic pyramid, right, has gone down too. So it's actually, at least from this very little data I have, is exactly the opposite of what you are saying, right? I, I don't know, I mean, it's just two years, it's a very little yeah, variation, right, right. but uh, the, I, I'm not sure if you, are, you, you may be right, but I, I, I'm not sure if you go that way. I would just say, I would just say I hope you're right. I hope Jerome's right. But my, my concern is that ultimately it's the it's the ad dollars that are going to determine it, and that's a problem mm -hmm. because the advertisers they're just going to care about a certain population. It becomes a problem. But I hope I, I hope you're right, and I think you may be right. Yeah. Question here. Um, I I have a comment about the uh, somebody say about the um, the demo democracy. Of, uh, of facts and, and, and realities. Um, considering the political implement implications of uh, um, mainstream media, uh, how do you comment on how, how, how much freedom has it offered to a certain um, geographical area, especially in the area where a lot of news are censored or a lot of facts or realities are censored or interpreted in a certain ways, especially in China or here in the United States, how it's going to affect the third parties who don't really have any voices in, in the mainstream media. Now, it's really interesting you say that. Uh, the, the last column I wrote for the Christian Science Monitor was after I just had met, he was over here on a State Department fellowship. He was a blogger from China who worked for China Daily, which I thought was insane because obviously all the media in China is controlled by the Chinese government. I'm like, what can you possibly be putting up? And he says, well, we allow we, photos. Everybody, you know, it's, you know, it's no different than the US. Everybody's got camera phones. So they're going out and they're snapping pictures of their camera phones. They uh, write a couple lines of text. Uh, they send it to us and we post it on our website. And I was like, this is, this is fascinating. Uh, you know, how do you choose, you know, what, what happens then? Well, we choose what goes on the front page. And, uh, uh, and I said, what do you do with controversial topics? And he said, They've told me, the government has told me, they're very excited by what I'm doing, but be careful. That was what they said. And he said that everybody has an individual page. They kind of have their own photo blog. And if uh, they have not issued him, they had not issued him rules for what he would do with 
taking pictures of things that are technically illegal, like strikes. He could take a picture of a strike. He could put, he, now, they would not let him post it on the front page, but the idea is this person could post it on their personal blog. And uh, I thought this is remarkable. And in two weeks, it had only been up for two weeks, it, the, you know, the, you, the number of people sending in photos of this was, was, was you know, it was, it was shooting up. And, he t and I went and I looked at the site and I thought it was really fascinating. I wrote about, wrote about it in a column. I wrote about it on a Saturday after looking at the website. When the column came out on Tuesday, the website had been taken down. <laughs> uh, and it's not, it's, uh, I was worried that I had done something. It wasn't that. There, there are things going on in China right now. There's another shakeup going on. And, and, um, and, and there is, there's going to be some, there, there, there are definite media. The person who is getting more control wants more control of the media. So he's obviously shut this thing down, uh, or at least I think. It's shut down. It says it's been it's been down for server maintenance now for like ten days. Okay, uh, but but the thing I thought when I wrote the column was this: once they let in the camera phones, to me the fight's over. At, at some point, whether you post those on a blog or whatever, some of those pictures are going to get out. I mean, I I, I think you know that they're going to they're going to try to maintain the tightest control they can over the media. You know, but but I think that you know this is the good. This is the this is the best part of blogging. This is the best part of citizen journalism. Citizen journalism at its best, they they won't be able to control it, and things are going to come out, and eventually it's 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 going to be hard and it's going to be a hard fought battle and they'll maintain control as tight as they can, but eventually they, they'll lose control. That's there's one there's one topic that uh, really hasn't been much discussed in our in our uh, three. Forum so far, and it's been Im implicit or embedded in in uh, some of the comments that have been made to today. And I'm, I'm wondering if if uh, we can get some comments from the panel and maybe from the audience about it. And that, to put it in its simplest form, is the tradition of political independence that is true of Western uh, newspapers and especially of American newspapers. Uh, there is no, uh, in, 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 in all of the complaints that one hears about the top-down media and the mainstream media, it's very, and of course there is, it's true that the mainstream media, the Washington Post, the New York Times, promulgate certain, in, in their editorials and in their news stories, promulgate certain perspectives on the world, there's no question about that. But they also themselves believe themselves to be committed to a different kind of aesthetic or moral uh, uh, mission, and that mission is to sort of tell the truth as they understand it to a citizenry that needs to hear these truths. Uh, and what those journalists do is protected constitutionally in the United States. A lot of other societies don't have that, and that constitutional protection, as everyone knows, does not extend to other media. It, uh, television news isn't completely protected in the same way. Uh, there's no evidence that, that online news will be protected in the same way. Uh, so my, uh, the, the question I want you to address in one sense is, uh, leave aside the feelings of any particular newspaper. Is there some ideal of what journalism is embedded in democratic societies and especially in the constitutionally protected rights of newspapers in the United States that should be protected, should be celebrated, should we, that we should try to find a way of, of extending these principles into the emer, into emerging media. Uh, uh, isn't this a loss if it's not the case? If we if, if we don't recognize that, the, the, the ideal I think one of them that's um, been brought up here, which is very relevant to this discussion, is the the being openness to um, information that you would have otherwise not might have clicked on on the internet, somebody brought this up recent, earlier with the, uh, with the opera review, and I think that's something to, to think about. And, and, but also the, the, um, the notion though on the, on the web that you're totally closed off is, is probably not the case because if you consider what we're talking about with China, um, there's a reason why they don't want to let other people to get out on the web is because you learn about much more different viewpoints than you would have otherwise. Certainly there's places in, in the United States even where um, you know, we have pockets of culture that are newspapers which would, which would um, have probably established fact as creationism with their readers. I mean, it's just a fact of where, you know, where we live in today, the United States. And those same people, if they go online, they might only go to creationist type of websites, but they're going to be exposed if they click around a lot to different viewpoints.
in mind that there are different traditions of the press when it comes to the relationship between the press in general, not just free newspapers or online, et cetera, et cetera, but the press in general, journalism, and the state and politics, right? And um, there are, to a certain extent, different manifestations of democracy. There are different ways. There is not just one kind of democracy. There are different kinds of democracy. And one of the main contributions that the press in, the different, in its different traditions have is that in general the state and large corporations etc. try to control the news agenda for obvious reasons, right? So uh, a well-funded, resourceful, autonomous press has always, tries always at least, to control, to monitor that, right? In part it does that, right? By providing a product that is different, by doing more and more investigation, more and more that. So, the way I bring this up is because this trend towards the commodification is actually decreasing the contribution that the press right. has, right, as a, a collective actor in different democratic societies. And that's why it's, it's a very, it's not just evident as you can tell, I'm obsessed with this issue, I spend a lot of time <laughs> thinking about this and trying to collect data and make sense of it. But I think it's important, it's socially relevant because it is, an important issue for all of us as citizens. Yes, I mean, P Pablo's findings have a paradoxical quality, obviously. I mean, because if the net is supposed to be so uh, uh, liberating and, pluralist, and pluralistic, yet if its effect on news is to make news more, uh, less pluralistic, that's very disturbing and very strange. It's obviously a very, very interesting uh, uh, project, and the paper is certainly go going to be something I want to read closely. Uh, Henry. Yeah, I, I guess you've succeeded in provoking me, David, to respond, and I was resisting doing so. But your statement... My intention. The, first, the yeah. statement that the First Amendment belongs to professional journalists is a pretty outrageous statement. Well, I didn't say I that, mean, did I? You, 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 you I certainly just said have implied that, I said that, twice now. I, I said the press in the United States is protected by the First Amendment. And you said other people are not protected. But in well, fact, well, the, the, the whole point of that is a right of political participation. Our founding fathers would certainly have been shocked to discover that it was professional journalists who had some sort of monopoly. Yes, but it's Congress on the First that did Amendment. that, Henry, not me. It's Congress that did that. I mean, there have been decisions that have not allowed the freedom that it goes to to a press to, to print papers to be applied in other media. It should be, of course. Well, there's, a, there's all. I, I think. I think. Yeah, I would that's say the legal, legal record decision. is the legal record is really would be disputed on that, and I think it's much more important for us to insist that the rights of citizen journalists and bloggers are protected from the First Amendment than to accept a premise that there's some sort of exclusive right of professionals but, uh, to control but free that speech was not my, I, I, That was not my assumption. I, my I, assumption was what the law is, actually. Yeah. No, I, I don't think I agree with you about where the law is on that, David, well, the, and that's the part of the problem. Well, the, the, the one thing is, the, the one thing is journalists do have a special responsibility in democracy because you can write anything you want, I, and you can write what you want on the web, but the fact of the matter, there, when you're a journalist, you, you actually, you know, and you are a, you're paid to do your job, which is the big thing about paying to be your job is you are accredited. Yes, that means that some government person is saying that you are allowed to do things, but unfortunately, not everybody can go through Congress and just, like, go up to the press gallery because it wouldn't be big enough, you know. Not everybody can, you know, sit in the White House press room. <laughs> Most people probably wouldn't want to. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's, there, there are special responsibilities involved in being a journalist, and, and, and you know, the democracy can't function properly without, without journalists doing their jobs because, it, it, look, they're the ones who have access to these people. And you might have had questions you wanted to ask George Bush before the war, and a lot of people might have had questions, but they weren't going to get to do it. It was the people who had the credentials who were going to get to do it. And, you know, they didn't do it <laughs> properly. A lot of people would say, and they'd probably be right. Uh, so there, there's, there is something special about the, the right, about the, the rights that are granted to accredited journalists to do things, yeah, not I mean, to say what they're going to say, but to have access to things that you don't have access to. No, uh, uh, Henry, I, I, maybe I just wasn't clear. I mean, you've misunderstood me. I did not at all want to imply that I didn't think these rights should extend to everyone. Of course I do. But I, my understanding is that legally in the United States, n television news does not have to the same complete freedom that the print papers do, that, 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 uh, uh, there, there have been, that there have been, I don't know if there have been Supreme Court decisions, but there have been decisions about how, how to apply questions of freedom of the press and, and uh, 
First Amendment freedoms that have not been extended to other media. I think they should be extended to other media. I think that the idea of the First Amendment should apply to all forms of, to all forms of communication. Of course, I would not want it restricted in any way. But in practice, it's not been the case. In, 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 and, and it's also obvious that in practice, uh, television news has not uh, uh, behaved in the, same, in the same way, taken the same kind of attitude toward its relation to uh, um, to, toward government, for example, or toward, toward its role as reporting, as, as print papers have. Of course, I hope that in, in the online world that is emerging, the, there will be uh, citizen journalists who will assert the same powers and, and uh, uh, rights of inquiry, no question. I certainly think that that should happen, it ought to happen. The, the FEC uh, this year had a, had a ruling come down with the, uh, with the political blogosphere. And, it was um, advocated by a bunch of um, regulatory, pro-regulatory um, organizations in D.C. that the, the participation in the political process by blogs, which are openly pro uh, partisan, be viewed as in-kind contributions, and especially for the links that they um, put out onto the, um, you know, contribute to these candidates now type of things. And ultimately, the FEC found that, um, that you, there was no way that they could write such, such sort of leg legislation for bloggers alone, and they sort of threw that out, rightly so, because you know, the what we're doing, what political bloggers are doing in uh, on the online world is no different than what you're doing when you go and talk to other people. That they have a, a wider audience that listens to them is not their choice when they participate in the dialogue. I wanna, can I ask a question here? For, for, sure. For, I want to ask a question, just following up with Dante, is is the access that the 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 press has uh, is it granted though because of the respect for those for their you know their rights and, and their um, position and their their ability to hopefully look at things objectively or is it granted because of the audiences they reach and the persuasion power that they have? Well, you know, ultimately, it's granted because the because the First Amendment is in the Constitution because they felt that for the government to work well, somebody had to tell everybody what was going on in the government and. It's just, you know, people have, people get paid to do this specific thing, to go and report on things, and, and not everybody can have access to just, to, to walk into to, to buildings and press conferences. I mean, it, it literally is a question of, it literally is a matter of, you know, just logistics, to be honest. I really think it's, you know, it's, and bloggers, I mean, bloggers were invited, and, and they will increasingly be invited. They'll be invited to do more and more stuff. But, but when they do that, they will be accepting the fact that they are, in some ways, becoming more like mainstream journalists. That's 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 part of the that's part of the deal. And I and I don't think it's I don't think it's about the fact that they're not that they're not biased. I mean, the National Review, uh, you know, the Nation. These people get press credentials as well. I, I I don't think you can separate it though from the fact that they they have audiences that they're they're open to persuasion with. If if the Nation didn't have any readers at all, I doubt that they would get yeah, as I, much access. Yeah, I, I think I think that's fair. That's that's also that's that's the question of when you have that's that's the same question as if you've got you know twenty candidates who are running for the Democratic nomination, but but really there's only four that have a legitimate shot at winning, and maybe they invite eight, uh, and the twelve or you know the the Larouche people stand in the balcony and yell down at people about how unfair <laughs> everything is. It, you know, it's it's just the lines are drawn at some point, and it's it is to some extent you're right. Yeah, there's a constituency for the for the for those candidates, there's a constituency for those media. Yeah, it's true. Well, the, the communications forum has entered a conversation about newspapers that's been going on in the society for a long time and will go on after our forums are over. I hope at least some of the things that have been said have been pro productive of further thought. I want to thank the audience and I want to thank our panel. <laughs>